So let me start by uh, thanking the organizers um, for this kind of invitation and for giving me the chance to exchange some ideas. When I had accepted the invitation, I was thinking like, oh gosh, go to Britain, talk about public and science. I mean, this is the tr island of treasures in the sense that any problem comes from there and any, any notion has been kind of phrased. Uh, that has moved over the continent over the years. And so what I'm going to talk about there, actually over the last 20 years or more, I have been preoccupied by questions related to science and society relations to issues of participation. And more recently, I've got attracted by what I would call how, how researchers and citizens alike do what I call anticipatory work. So that's the work and anticipation. Therefore, I decided I would like to address in this talk the shifting relation between science as a public good, sci in that sense as a central agent for shaping societal development, and what at any given point in time was regarded as a good public. So this is a kind of relationship of co-production in the sense that if we think about science as a public good, we have to think is what is our notion of the good public that comes along with it. And that's the angle and the twist I would like to give to my thinking today. We live in times when more than ever before, I would claim, science and technology are seen as central driving forces if not as the central driving force for the development of contemporary societies. If we look at Europe's most recent policy initiative, Innovation 2020, let's leave aside that there comes also the notion of flagship. Uh, we are told that science and technology now captured in the notion of innovation, I quote, provides real benefits for us as citizens, consumers and workers. It speeds up and improves the way we conceive, develop, produce, and access new products, industrial processes, and services. It is the key not only to creating more jobs, building a greener society, and improving our quality of life, but also to maintaining our competitiveness on the global market. So if you just take these couple of lines, you see that this is a kind of pompastic imaginary about what science and technology is going to do for us, whatever the us really is. But that's not all. Captured in the idea of responsible research and innovation, societal actors should be, I quote, working together during the whole research and innovation process in order to better align both the process and its outcomes with values, needs, and expectations of Europe, of European society. So throughout the whole research process, whatever this exactly means. The European Research Area Board, then so the highest kind of policy thinking body, has rounded off this discursive picture by publishing last year a report pondering over the fact whether or not and how Europe will be, I quote, innovated out of the crisis. So that is an interesting kind of, of capturing this whole idea about what is innovation doing in and with Europe. Speaking towards 2020, there is an acknowledgement that a major financial and with it social crisis has come into the way of our last future, the one of the Europe 2010, the so-called Lisbon agenda, which had promised to turn Europe in the most competitive knowledge economy of the world and thus give us social stability and welfare to, I quote, everybody. What seems an unbroken, what seems unbroken is the belief um, that the public, which might not show sufficiently ready or to, to cherish and support uh, this move, that is the real concern that is in these documents. Therefore, society needs to be taken on board which is expressed in a brochure explaining that we need to, I quote, develop joint solutions to societal problems and opportunities and to preempt, and I think that's the important part, to preempt possible public value failures and of future innovation. The notion of preemption will be something I will be coming back to in, throughout my uh, talk. 
This is a document called Responsible Research and Innovation, Europe's ability to respond to societal challenges. It seems essential to make a disclaimer immediately. I do not think that European policy discourse does by any means represent the diversity of things happening in the different member states in more local or regional bodies. I think it just captures one thread that runs through this part of the world to the discourses in this part of the world. And, that's, and I would like to see it as a kind of indicator for change more than really describing anything that is happening. Now, I would like to start my reflections actually with one part of my title, namely the, the public good. And I would like to take you back 20 years to a paper written by Michel Callon called Science as a Public Good? Question mark. In this effort of thinking what it would mean to call science a public good, he starts from the economic consideration what a public good would mean. In economics, the public good is a good that is both inexcludable and non revilerous meaning that individuals cannot be excluded from its use, at least in theory, and that the use by one individual does not necessarily re reduce the availability to the others. The limits, I don't want to discuss this definition, but we all get aware of these limits when we speak about food and water and other things that have been long conceptualized as public goods. Uh, and he continues with an interesting comparison, I find, namely between what is the difference between a Ford Taunus, and I'm not discussing here his taste of cars, and Einstein's general relativity theory, which of course I appreciate as a physicist. After quite extensive considerations on the conditions, which I do not want to elaborate on here, he comes to two conclusions which seem important for my thinking today. First, he reminds us that without institutions that have been created and reinforced over centuries, without the intense energy invested by scientists and the stake, state to make scientific knowledge public, the theory of relativity would have never ceased being what it, always, what it has always been, a potentially privatizable good, no different from any other goods. So what he underlines here is this idea that we have to care for institutions. And we ha have to care for the way researchers and research institutions actually work and what the role of the state is in relation to these res research organizations. Making science public, so his argument, thus needs certain institutional structures, needs the commitment of scientists and the state, both. He ends his reflection with an interesting argument why this making knowledge public is so essential even from an economic point of view. Science is a public good but must be preserved at all costs because it is a source of variety, Argus. It causes new states of the world to proliferate. And this diversity depends on the diversity of interests and projects, interests and projects that are included in those collectives that reconfigure nature and society. So those co collectives that think and work and make this interaction between science and society happen. Now, actually the notion of the good has been predominantly read through an economic lens and this directs our concerns to public regulation of the public good or to issues of state provision of public goods. That's mainly what it is discussed about. Yet it leaves a size, I want to argue, a broader meaning embedded in this very idea of the good. We could ask whose values and aspiration would define what the good could and should mean, and good for whom. In a globalized and diversified world, we could ask for the distribution of the good and for power and value differences that might occur in the frame of this distribution. It is important to ask these questions as the notion of the public good gains importance at times when key values get relocated from the public realm to the private realm. Biomedicine is a particularly good example for some of these moves. To the private realm of individuals who should be able to choose 
So the question is not anymore how do we kind of think it as a collective, as a society, or whatever the kind of collective entity might be, but it's about leaving a lot of decisions to the public, to the idea that somebody can choose freely out of a number of options. Therefore, we need to pay close, and that's a form, if you want so, of neoliberal politics. Therefore, we want to pay close attention what is actually meant by public and the public, and what is its use entails when we speak about it in relation to science as a public good. Where is the place, the moment when the idea of the public takes shape and the meaning of the good is defined? This seems all the more important as we live in societies which show a growing diversity of its membership and values, and also with this diversity, a number of different aspirations that become uh, clearly visible. Now, let me start by having a short look at the European policies of making science public. Let me call it like that. Um, and these are just a number of logos which show how the kind of idea shifted. I found that quite interesting how the visualizations capture already this idea of the single individual summing up to the society down to this horizon talk, which we, which we now are confronted with, I would say. Uh, maybe that's not a very nice formulation. To address these issues, I will come back to the shifts in the European policy regarding uh, so science and society issues and question which imaginaries of the science innovation and the related public realm, society or the constituencies or whatever is at the center, citizens, consumers, supporters, is embedded in these issues. Without going into details of any particular nation state, the question of European policies addressing and framing this issue seems interesting to me. Not in an absolute term, evidently, but as a place where Europe gets constructed and imagined and science for the European public good gets performed. As I will argue, these policy shifts do not come out of the blue, but much rather are framed, accompanied and followed by researchers. Ever new terminologies get coined and a number of STS and related terminologies made it into Brussels lived through interesting transformations, I would call that now, of course, interesting is not valued here at all, and uh, have kind of become common language without having transported large parts of the meaning they had in the place where they came from, which is a beautiful example of transfer and of transferring the good into different political realms. Um, as much as there is um, no single Europe, there is no single scientific community. This is an easy thing to say. Thus, I will apologize from the start that the picture will be necessarily sketchy and short, but I, I, you will see at the end what kind of argument I'm trying to build um, on that. Um, oops, okay. It is possible to claim that over the past two decades or more, issues concerning the relation of science and society have actually gained increasing visibility on the policy agenda in many European countries, yet in very, very different formats and intensity. Britain is here a very particular case, which is, by the way, if you do a research on the published literature, you will see that Britain is an interesting kind of dominant case that is there. Uh, I don't know if it's a Britification or whatever one can call that, but it's an interesting point of reference of thinking that is kind of, of embedded there. Um, um, if you would compare UK and Austria, which is evident coming from that country, this would immediately show who the fundamental differences in both framing the issues at stake who sees itself as center or periphery, as follower or as being followed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, in a nutshell, there is a strong belief that the future of Europe can be shaped through allowing a continuous flow of techno-scientific innovations to happen. Thus, so the rather straightforward conclusion, a science and innovation-friendly climate is needed which supports and carries these developments. Indicator for such an innovation-friendliness would be, first of all, 
a more generalized trust in expertise, that would be comfortable. No major rejections of innovations which have already seen considerable investment, because that would be an economic problem, such as in the GMO case. But above all, future generations, we want future generations seeing science and technology as prestigious and fascinating career opportunities. So we want more reproduction. Of course, not in the general sense of wanting people get interested in science on a broader level. We want them to be interested in particular areas, which we see as strategic at, a po a po at this given point in time. As the French minister said once very clearly, and I appreciate for his outspokenness, we don't want more humanities and social scientists. We need more engineers. So at least he had the honesty on his side. The broader narrative, framing accompanying these changes, are a fierce competition expressed through the notion of the global race, but also the negative scenarios of Europe lagging behind. Standing still is seen as falling behind, to use one of Barbara Adams' expressions describing the feeling of speeding up and lacking to move ahead. This creates a continuous feeling of pressure and a need to act quickly, I quote, before it is too late. In all that, the public, the citizens, and whatever labels that is used, they are constructed as an at least potential problem, getting in the way of this innovation stream. Thus, the public is here used mainly as either one to be convinced or one that will remain a continuous problem, a pain in pushing this innovation agenda. These beliefs have gradually consolidated in European policy, which has nonetheless, and that is important to highlight, gone through a number of discursive and, and, and pr programmatic sorry, shifts with regard to the framing of science and society issues. And I have tried to capture that very shortly in this graphic, where you see that um, it starts with monitoring the degree of informedness and, and studies kind of the knowledgeable European citizens. It focuses very much on science communication and adapted things. We have a bit later the making people understand the beneficial impact and limitations of science and sensitize researchers for public concern. That's interesting because this program has virtually no research in it. It's purely like making people understand, as if this is a, something like a common knowledge thing. You just go about and talk to people, and then everything will be better off. But what is interesting, the researchers are called here for, for rendering science its authenticity, and for convincing people of the fascination they live every day in their work. I'm not kidding. Um, then it moves on with the early, with the turn of the millennium, it, it moves on into this idea of a dialogue, participation, and governance. And this is probably one of the most important shifts in thinking about science and society issues, um, and, and of, of kind of opening up certain uh, kinds of broader concerns about these issues. This does not mean that the program then did fund, most of the time, this kind of research. There was a lot of money going still in the kind of classical communication activities and not necessarily, or a lot of things got relabeled, which is also one of the kind of more problematic issues.